Hi there everybody, this is me again, Pat Windrow at the Cable Diesel with a program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life. Uh, we go out with a camera, set it up to a scene that seems to be paintable and then run it for a half an hour or better and then project it here in the studio and that's the closest that I can get to painting out of doors with cameras around. So uh, this one, this program is going to be done in two parts and this is obviously part one. It is going to be the cap tree bridge from yet another angle. I've done this now twice before and here is another interesting angle of this very remarkable structure that was put up almost a half a century ago. And we may have all gotten so used to this cap tree bridge that we don't realize that it is a half a century old. Built in, uh, completed in 1954 under the um, auspices of Robert Moses, who was commissioner of parks and so on at that time. And it is a, uh, it is a remarkable structure. Uh, I love bridges anyway. So uh, one of Brooklyn Bridge one being one of my favorite structures in all the world. And uh, this one, of course, comes very close because it goes to such a neat place. It goes over there to those barrier reefs on the, the Atlantic Ocean from Long Island. Um, while I'm talking about it, I'm going to lay this out and maybe um, try to get some uh, facts about the bridge uh, in and as well as facts about how to go about painting such a scene. This is a scene with a horizon line which I call high. It's a high horizon line. There's very little sky. Most of the interest is in the foreground and foregrounds can make or break a picture so let's just lay out uh, the um, the horizon line which is the di most distant point uh, horizontal of course is the word that is uh, tandem to horizon and there we have a painting divided in two this is sky part this is land part and or water part. So this is already a composition of one line. I keep talking about composition because it is a scary thing for most people who are just beginning to paint. Uh, here is the land mass in the distance, just barely sketched in so that we know where we are. And um, uh, there is a two line composition. The bridge, of course, is slightly curved because it is going over the horizon, not onto the other side, but it is in fact spanning from a point uh, which is approximately from here, and it spans very gently. There is an extremely gentle curve, but it, it is there nevertheless. Even though it may look straight, it is still a gentle curve, and that is the sum total of the uh, way you would, the way you would uh, architecturally draw this bridge. This is, of course, the span on which the cars go. And here in perspective, uh, somewhat perspective, are the stanchions on which it rests. It is almost not there, but you have to make sure that you differentiate and see it. Otherwise, the bridge isn't going to make any sense. Here is the wonder, that wonderful sort of central swell, which makes for the uh, structure that holds the uh, suspension of it. Um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful line. I'm sure that when the architect designed this, he, uh, he had aesthetics in mind because it's a lovely curve and makes for, the, uh, for what I call the paintability of this particular structure. Architectural paintings are, are, are a problem. You have to have them right, otherwise they look awful. Uh, if I don't get this one right, I can always erase. But the, um, you, have to, you have to make sense out of what you see, and this uh, goes below the span, and therefore anchors into the 
to the uh, stanchions, which are uh, concrete and steel, uh, to the best of my knowledge. I'm, I love bridges, but I'm not a bridge builder. Therefore, engineer-wise, I'm not sure that I know exactly what I'm talking about. But I like to be able to make sure that what I paint is going to make some sense. Here is the other side of the bridge, and I see from my reference material over there that that part comes down. So we have here sort of like a like a, an arch, a, a kind of a pointed arch, very much like the Brooklyn Bridge, but uh, different in, in, in other ways. And here is the thickness of it. So this is the important sketching that has to be done with this painting. If you don't sketch it, uh, you've missed the point. Uh, the, you, the, the people who have programs saying that you can start applying paint to canvas immediately uh, and pay no attention to drawing, I have, I have a great deal of problems with. So I always believe that um, my programs has to be, have, to, have to start out with the basic uh, fundamental business of drawing what you're going to paint. And I also count. Uh, so this is one stanchion. Then directly underneath here, there is the second one. And then I see another one, a double one. And one, two, three, four. So between here and the end of the painting, there are four. Um, it is important to keep these things accurate because painters are in fact Reporters. So we do we do a job of reporting what we see. We're not uh, verbal reporters. We are visual reporters. And if you don't uh, get it correct, then somebody is going to say uh, you missed it. This is not the place that you were telling me it was. So here we have. And of course, the stanchions in the distance there, because they're far away and they begin to recede very quickly. They are smaller in size, but they are nevertheless there. And I'm laying them out. I will paint over them in a little while. But this is just to show you the general approach. Here would be, of course, the vertical um, uh, hanging uh, suspension wires of this span. And then, of course, there are some, uh, some, some wonderful designs that are sort of uh, going to be interpreted. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this a rendering as if it, this was a, a studio of uh, bridge building design, but I want to make it as, as accurate as possible so that it's recognizable. Uh, bridges, of course, um, whether anybody uh, has the feeling about them the way I do, probably uh, stems from the fact that man had to have a bridge. He has, he has to know that he can get somewhere else and that nothing is going to prevent him from getting to that place over there, wherever it happens to be, beyond the water or beyond the mountain or beyond the um, that ravine. He wants to get over there. So uh, because nobody is ever satisfied from staying here, bridges came. The plank uh, across the stream or the fallen tree across the stream is the first bridge. Maybe the, maybe the stones that you threw across the creek bed is the first bridge. But bridges, I think, are actually uh, sort of the history of how restless we are. We, uh, we just want to get someplace else, and bridges are important and have to do that. Here is the other horizon line. I mean, here's the other um, hor horizontal line that is going to be this uh, jetty or this uh, this structure in the center of the picture. It is going to be important because it's going to tell the story that between here, between here and there, there's another body of water. And as I said, being a recorder, you have to have it accurate. This. Um, this goes all the way across the painting. So we're going to have here uh, what, what I would call a ribbon composition. The ribbons are going to be the objects. The sky is the top ribbon. The bridge is going to occupy a ribbon coming farther down. Then this great span of water in the middle, the jetty in between, and then just laying it out now because I'm, not, I'm going to be painting over it. Then is the thing that we are that is always to be sought after is the vertical. The vertical, I mean, I'm, ah, the, um, the angle lines. The, uh, you have to cause interest in these, in, in compositions, and therefore you try to find the diagonals, which are going to give you the depth. This diagonal is merely a guideline for those pilings. The pilings are almost the point of this painting. Uh, they tell the story. They are going to be foremost in the, in the composition. They're also going to uh, supply you with the uh, deliciousness of reflections. Reflections to me are one of the more interesting things ever in painting. Uh, I'm placing this one over here 
uh, and stopping it at this line. The, 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 the line that I, this diagonal line is where the piling ends in the water. So this is merely a, um, a reference of how you're going to go about getting these correctly. And uh, it is important to do guidelines. It's very much like lettering. You can't do lettering unless you have guidelines. These pilings are, have to be understood that if they're not in perspective, the painting won't come off, as they say. I mean, it will not, you can't pull off the, uh, the visual tricks, which is what, uh, which is what painting is. It is uh, optical illusions. We are, after all, working on a flat surface, and um, I'm trying to make you believe that these things are receding into the distance. The only way you're going to do that is with perspective and drawing them. Uh, over here, there are some unimportant pilings of this rotten dock that's here in the, in the background, but nevertheless, it is, in fact, uh, important to uh, to know, to understand that they're there. These reflections are, of course, going to take place towards the end of the painting. Uh, probably part two will take care of these reflections, and that's one of the reasons that you do these wonderful compositions. The this this one ends here, and this this right. So here's a perfectly simple layout. They're a little bit complicated, but simple to a degree. And now comes the time when you apply paint to canvas. I have um, I have some uh, palette, which is a sort of an improvisational piece. This is a leftover piece of canvas board. I'm always economically uh, conscious of what I'm telling the audience to do. I do not believe that uh, beginners or even or even people who are trying their hand at it for the second time, second year, uh, fifth year, have to go out and spend a fortune in supplies. Uh, I think that an awful lot of the programs uh, try to en enlist your um, enthusiasm and then hit you with the business of needing to buy expensive things like $50 pallets made out of mahogany. It's not necessary. And uh, to, uh, to go buy the kit, the kit being, of course, what it is with the name attached. The, person's, the per person who is giving the program attaches his name to the kit, and that becomes more expensive than if you will buy the pieces individually on sale. Uh, Well-known brands, but there are sales everywhere. So uh, just as little asides as I can, I try to tell people what I'm conscious of as an instructor. Uh, the supplies are of vital interest to people who are going to start in. Uh, that's probably the main part of the questions that come to me uh, as, I do my, as I do the program uh, live on Tuesday nights. Um, the questions are, where do you get your supplies and what should I buy? So here I'm, I'm just blocking in this color here and I'm going to smooth it out. This is quick drying paint being put on with a palette knife, but I'm going to do this as a brush painting. Uh, as you can see, all this wonderful drawing now is going to disappear appear pretty much and then we'll have to do it again uh, in the painting but um, the uh, the need to show you the steps that I, that I take is probably the whole point of my doing this uh, uh, from the beginning so I'm going to I'm going to apply this uh, this color that I put on with the palette knife to 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 be speedy with it uh, speed is not necessarily the trick that I'm using but it is something which is vital if you're out there working against the elements and time uh, the Sun has a, a rather remarkable way of uh, changing position and if you don't work fast you're going to find yourself suddenly with shadows that were there four hours ago and you're still piddling around with some problem that you should have been able to solve uh, early on in the painting. Now as you can see there is a gray quality that is taking place here because a lead pencil um, picks up, uh, the oil rather, picks up the lead pencil um, uh, lines and that's okay. The, um, the, the paint dries quickly enough that if it bothers you very much. You can wait a little while and then the paint, the paint will be uh, uh, dry enough for you to be, be able to apply over again. But um, I, as I say, these are not intended to be finished masterworks. These are instructional pieces and I tell you the pitfalls and the things to watch for as you go along. But for the most part, there is the general position of that bridge with a sort of a ghostly um, sketch that is left from the lead pencil having been picked up by the brush on the oil. Well, 
there's a lot of texture to this uh, because I'm working with rather thick paint and um, texture is what oils are all about. Uh, if you don't want texture then you uh, then you work in watercolor but I like um, I like the idea of having a lot of um, visibility in the texture of oil paints. Uh, it doesn't happen in any other medium. You do not get texture in pastels, watercolors, pencil drawings. You only get texture in oils. Now I'm going to put the uh, distant uh, land mass uh, in, in interpretive. This is uh, strictly interpretive. I'm not going to follow every single bump that is over there. Uh, it's not. Uh, that's not the point of the painting. Uh, but it has to be there, and it's the and it's the thing that is coming closer to you as you got the sky in. The horizon uh, begins to work towards the foreground, and you uh, you uh, pay attention to the not just the focus of that uh, distant uh, land, but also to the color. And color is in focus. It's a little bit smoky. It's a haze has. Um, has dimmed uh, the color of green. It's not brilliant green as you take it out of the tube. And this is a combination of a touch of uh, sap green, a touch, oddly enough, of, um, of uh, spectrum purple to uh, lower the intensity of the, of the green because we are dealing with Long Island atmosphere. And atmosphere is a, is a magical thing. It takes color out of everything. But it's uh, typical of Long Island. And if you want to be a realist, you pay attention to what is typical of the place that you're painting. There is, uh, there is the uh, suggestion of the land in the distance. Um, with some yellow ochre and some of my quick drying uh, white, I'm going to put in rather rapidly and rather thickly the beach uh, area that's over there. Oh, that's, that's a little bit too yellow. It's, uh, it's very far away and it should be much whiter than that. So the beach area is, uh, is just a, an, uh, an interpretive line of color running across. This is another one of the ribbons that I'm talking about in this kind of a composition. Um, the, uh, the wonderful, uh, brilliant white quality of the beaches here on Long Island in the summertime are, of course, to be seen on beaches around the world. But somehow here with the greenery that is uh, so prevalent on Long Island, there's a lot of green that grows right down towards the water, uh, makes, these, um, makes the white beaches even more, uh, even more intriguing. Uh, so w with, uh, with the need to do a short break, uh, I'll be right back and uh, let's just think a little bit further about bridges, so I'll be right back. With so little time left on this particular one, let's carry on immediately with this uh, for with the background that is taking place. And here, with some yellow ochre, a touch of sienna, is going to be the area which is um, explained to me uh, being darker. It's wet. This is the part of the beach that is wet. Uh, the 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 uh, the tides come in and out. Of course, thank goodness. If they didn't, we'd be in real trouble. But the wetness of the of the beach, even at this distance, is visible with this slightly wonderful cinnamony pale color and Sarah so now we have three bands of color four the blue the green the pale beach and now this uh, wet sand area all right uh, coming along and moving down uh, towards the forest towards the middle ground is the is the water 
the water is of course the basic color of the uh, of the mixing of the water is um, uh, the white and then uh, uh, ultramarine blue. Stay away from phthalo blue. It is an absolute dangerous color to do with and it is, uh, has virtually no relationship to anything in nature. Phthalo blue uh, is uh, very seductive but it's also extremely annoying uh, when you use it in the context of uh, nature pictures. Uh, phthalo blue can be used when you're doing synthetic things such as neon lights and uh, fabrics with very brilliant colors and uh, and generally things which are, are not uh, authentically represent re representative of nature. So I'm going to put this water in with the palette knife. This is a nice little 69 cent plastic palette knife which I find is um, perfectly adequate for this kind of demonstration and the other palette knives that are got little mahogany handles and little stainless steel blades cost anywhere from eight to twenty five dollars. So for 69 cents I'm perfectly content with this one and uh, the uh, the need to get this middle ground in very rapidly is because uh, the pilings that we drew and that I showed you how to lay something out are going to be painted over it. You would not paint around them. You would paint them on top of the color. So what you're really doing here is preparing the background for the pilings. I have not mixed enough so I'm going to take some more some more of the white, some more of the blue, a touch of cerulean blue, which is, um, which is because this is summertime and out there these blues become extremely brilliant under the, um, under the uh, wonderful clarity of some of the summer skies that we have, have had. Uh, there's been a sort of a lack of rain, but the clarity of the skies has certainly been a, a painter's uh, bonus. So here is the central part of this, um, of this body of water directly below the bridge. The bridge of course is going to come on part two and that means that um, part two is going to be done at another time and the paint will be dry enough therefore to be able to lay over, draw over this background. The whole point of this is that we are laying in the background for two events, the bridge and the uh, pilings in the foreground. Uh, there is a, a nice streak of dark color running through this body of water here probably because the tide is moving and there is there is the need to uh, be as accurate as possible so I'm running this dark line that was pure um, uh, ultramarine blue right out of the tube on this brush and pulling it across the um, the blue that I put in with the palette knife here is where the um, here is where this central part of the uh, of the of the blue ends and it's somewhat lighter than the foreground not much but a little bit lighter than the foreground and a, 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 a phenomenon which I will not question because these phenomenons take place all the time in in, in landscape painting there is a slight nice pale color that is running on top of this. All of these things are uh, can't possibly be remembered by the uh, human eye and that's why I always stress working from life because wonderful things happen out there. They're spontaneous and they are unexpected uh, just like weather and uh, if you if you rely purely on your memory, you can't possibly get what I call the interesting incidentals that happen uh, as you're out there. So here we have uh, another uh, set that we're all working in horizontals. All of this is going to be changed uh, as soon as the verticals go in and the whole atmosphere of the picture will change. I'm going to be now mixing some of this foreground, some of the, the um, uh, uh, strange whatever it is that is accumulated on that uh, on this uh, dock that is coming out. It looks to me as though it's an abandoned dock that has had grass growing on it and then a mixture of sand and a mixture of pale sand and a mixture of grass. So it is a, sort of a very pale, almost nondescript greenish tone. Uh, many times even me with uh, the experience that I've had working out of doors I am unable to s really decipher what some of these colors are. Uh, so when they seem as indistinct as they as they appear, then you make them indistinct also. Don't invent. If you think that you see something which is uh, very mysterious, let it be mysterious. And here are some patches of some pale color, probably some 
sand that has uh, either been washed up on there or there is sand or it's an abandoned dock that used to have sand and so on. So here we have the, uh, the sort of incomprehensible middle part of this painting and that's okay. If it's incomprehensible that'll make for its mystery. What it is actually though is the background for the other things. I'm mixing a dark tone. I'm using uh, kind of an interesting bunch of colors here. The sienna, the uh, ultramarine blue, some of the purple, and some of this um, uh, vermilion red. I want to get a kind of, an, of, a, of a nondescript color for the lower part of that, uh, of this um, dock that is st sticking out in the water. And that is done by mixing a whole bunch of well, uh, sort of incomprehensible tones together, including sap green. But you'll find that when you mix these colors, you, you will get um, uh, interesting color schemes. So below this here, uh, I'm putting in with the palette knife. I'm mixing palette knife and brush, as you probably noticed, because uh, there are certain textures here that are going to, that require uh, uh, a different, a different feeling. Uh, the palette knife is a, is a, um, obviously through this demonstration you can see you can get really wonderful sharp lines with it, with the edge of the knife, and uh, then you can, if they're too sharp, then you can blur them with the um, with the brush. Um, as I uh, as I've put that in for the uh, for the the lower part of this dock, I'm going to be picking up. Now, some almost pure uh, white, which I need to squeeze more on, uh, for these pilings uh, that are now sort of used. They're gray, they are, um, they are old, uh, but they're there, nevertheless. And they're, I'm not going to count them all, but they sort, of, they sort of make an appearance here. And they are equidistant, and some of them are quite close together. So marine scenes are always quite wonderful because they have the unexpected. In other, in other words, abandoned things are equally as interesting as, as new ones, sometimes even more so. They have a, a, a more mysterious quality about them, and many times uh, quite a wonderful design. So here is an interpretive way of putting these old pilings in um, that uh, may or may not be comprehensible a little bit later. However, and here's one that's sort of sideways. So this one goes sideways and so does this one. And in the, in the background, uh, I see that there are some little heads sticking up. So that's the other side of the dock. Just very, very um, interpretively to put in the presence of those little low um, pilings uh, on the other side. Um, I'm run out of time, I think, um, but I'll just keep going until I get the dreaded signal. And by running out of time, it means that part one of my uh, third study uh, of the Cap Tree Bridge is almost over. But as I say, an interesting subject matter should never prevent people from doing it over and over again. Uh, Van Gogh uh, painted that famous and wonderful bridge at Arles eight or nine times. He never got tired of it. I have find myself uh, repeating scenes on Long Island many, many times because uh, if they are beautiful or if they're interesting or mysterious or even uh, strange, uh, they are worth repeating uh, again and again. And every time you do them over, you learn something new about them. Here is the, um, here is the third and final large band of, of color, uh, all part of the background for the um, events that are going to take place in part two, namely the bridge and the pilings. But they all had to be prepared ahead of time. It may be interesting to know that you do these things in phases. And uh, if, you, if you understand that uh, they are overlays, that oil painting is uh, a series of, of laying pa uh, paint uh, coming towards you on overlays. Well, so much for that one. Looks like that's the end of this program. If you were interested at all in part one of the Cap Tree Bridge study, try to tune in on, chapter, on part two, and then we'll find the conclusion of this uh, composition. Thanks for watching. This is Pat Window saying see you next time.